Good morning, Walnut Village. Would you join me as we begin in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father and gracious God, I ask that you would open my mouth, and I ask that you would open our hearts and minds to the hear speaking of your word and the hearing of it. Teach us and mature us as we work through this passage together. In your son's name, amen. Okay, last week we were in the first half of Mark chapter 8, and today we'll finish that chapter up with a couple of uh, side discussions about the title Son of Man and the title Messiah. So in the first half of Mark 8, we saw a repeat miracle. Jesus feeds a crowd of over 4,000 uh, men, which really in reality is upwards of 10,000 people because only men were counted, but we know there were women and children there. But only this time with the second feeding that we read in last week, the disciples doubt uh, what Jesus is able to do. They're uncertain. They're, they're kind of off balance. And it comes, oddly enough, on the heels of them already witnessing the miracle of Jesus feeding 10,000, 11,000 people just a short time before. The memory of the past faithfulness of Jesus should have caused them to trust him for their present and future needs. But we saw that it didn't. In the story, the fish, and this is an odd little fact, the fish are held back until after Jesus breaks the bread and distributes the bread. Now perhaps the disciples needed to see first what Jesus would do before completely turning over all food that they had. It's not unlike us. We don't always want to turn everything over to God and His control. We maybe hold something back, doubt just a little bit, wait and see. But in the hands of Jesus, common everyday things, fish, bread, turn into miracles. And we should never uh, doubt and we should always be willing to put everything in His hands. Well, we saw that the crowd is fed, and as Jesus often does, then after the energy expended on teaching and preaching and healing and miracles of this, he seeks out a quiet place to be with God and with his disciples. And so they cross the lake um, to a quiet place for this prayer and teaching. But even so, his name, his reputation is so widespread through the area, people seek him out, and a crowd gathers again, pressing Jesus for healing. Now in that crowd, there was somebody else. There was a group of Pharisees, and they had come specifically not to see the healing and the teaching his people did. They came because their power was threatened, and they came with the hope of trapping Jesus, to make him look bad, to see him make a mistake in his public ministry, to undermine his ministry. So they came there to challenge. Now Mark uses an interesting word here that we talked about last week. The word that he uses is a most closely meaning tempt. And it's the same word that uh, was used describing the exchange between Jesus and Satan in the wilderness. And uh, Satan had come to destroy Jesus, to tempt him. But we know that, again, Jesus was victorious in this. So the Pharisees come to tempt, to challenge, to test, and they're not there just to see a healing or to see something that would show and demonstrate love of the people. No, they come demanding a sign, a miracle like fire from the sky, uh, for no other purpose than to have Jesus step up and show his, his deity and authority. They want fire from the sky. And at this point, Jesus just doesn't hurl fire at them, which he could have. He doesn't just walk away. He doesn't get totally angry with them. We read that he sighs deeply in his spirit and has a sadness for the hardness of the heart of the Pharisees. He so desperately wants them to follow, to believe, to put their faith in God, in the Messiah, the coming Messiah, and instead they miss it. They're entrapped in their own religious constructs. And what they don't know is that when Jesus does these miracles, he always performs them in the context of mercy, grace, and kindness. That truly is the kingdom of God. So Jesus then says, enough, and he gets back into the boat and leaves the Pharisees and returns to the other side of the lake. But he uses the time for more teaching with his disciples. 
And we started to read uh, last week about the whole idea that he uses, Jesus that is, of leavening, leavening bread. And leavening, he uses as a warning of how the presence of just a little sin, like just the presence of a little leaven, can puff up and corrupt the unsuspecting person. We also then read that the disciples begin a pointless argument among themselves. Uh, pretty typical of human nature, right? And Jesus then gently chastises them for missing the point of his teaching, for their lack of understanding. Remember, both Herod and the Pharisees idolized the kingdom as domineering power and authority. Herod saw it more as political power and authority, and the Pharisees saw it as more religious power and authority but neither neither one saw it as it truly was which was a kingdom of love and a kingdom of the heart and Jesus wanted the disciples to clearly understand this to not miss this finally then last week we saw Jesus performing a different type of healing he heals a blind man if you remember in a progressive staging where the man first has his eyes opened but sees imperfectly Remember, he said to Jesus, I see people walking around as trees. And then the blind man receives complete healing. Previous miracles that we saw were instantaneous, immediate. This is the only uh, gradual or progressive healing that we see in the Gospels. It is another example of the variety of healing methods Jesus used. It may be that Jesus chose this method as at this time as an illustration for his disciples to show them that their spiritual blindness uh, was overtaking them. Shown in the previous passage, um, he's trying to say your blindness uh, is only going to be healed gradually. Remember Paul talks about this when he says, he who start, started or began a good work in you will complete it till its end. Our journey here on life is being a, a, a time for us to mature in our understanding of God. We're being perfected. And we can see this as an illustration as this man's sight is being perfected and then eventually healed by Jesus. Okay, so let's jump into our passage for today. Mark 8, 27 through verse 9, 1. And we start off with Peter's declaration about Jesus. Uh, Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. As they were walking along, Jesus asked them, Who do people say I am? Now I'll stop there. Jesus asked this question as an introduction to more important follow-up questions, which we're going to see. Jesus clearly knew who he was. Jesus knew and understood what people were saying about him. So this question is just an introductory question. Verse 28, Well, they replied, meaning the disciples, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say you are one of the other prophets. Well, the people's understanding of that day was that both John and Elijah were national reformers who stood up to the corrupt rulers of their day. Perhaps in seeing Jesus as John the Baptist or Elijah, people hoped for a political Messiah who would overthrow the corrupt powers oppressing Israel at that time. Verse 29, then he asked them, but who do you say I am? It's a very personal question, a very direct question that opens up a lot of learning, teaching, and understanding for the disciples. Then who do you say I am? But Peter replied, you are the Messiah. Now Peter knew the opinion of the crowd Though complimentary toward Jesus, it wasn't accurate. Peter wanted to correct the situation. Jesus was much more than John the Baptist or Elijah or a prophet. And even if Peter didn't fully know the answer who Jesus was, he answered correctly, you are the Messiah. He, Jesus was more than a national reformer, more than a miracle worker, although he was these things, more than a prophet. Jesus is and was the Christ, the Messiah. But Jesus warned them, going on verse 30, not to tell anyone about him. Okay, here comes a sad part of the chapter. And think how shocking and difficult this would be for the disciples to hear this. Verse 31, 
Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man, and I'll come back to this verse. Let me just stop here for a little additional teaching. The Son of Man. This is a title that's uh, used by Jesus to describe himself uh, close to 70 times in the Gospels. And I, I want to just uh, take a little bit of time on that particular um, description, title, that Jesus uses. The Son of Man. You remember when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, and uh, it, it said at that time, uh, we read, a voice from heaven when Jesus came up out of the water said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Well, in Jesus' time in the Jewish culture, sons were viewed as being chosen, prepared with a purpose to carry on the vision of the Father. And this understanding helps to shape the significance of Jesus being called the Son of Man. Jesus uses this title, the Son of Man, in conjunction with his prophetic words about his own suffering. He deeply related to the suffering of his fellow humans. He knew he had to suffer to demonstrate that he understood their suffering. And he uses this title, Son of Man, to identify with humans, with people. Jesus, as we know, was a carpenter, a, a humble trade, a tradesman. And his teaching was consistently connected with humility and love for others above himself. So he is a serving man, um, serving humankind. Son of Man underscores this. He served men much like a son serves his family. Overall, Jesus was here to follow the will of the Father, and that will was for Jesus to serve people in order to be the bridge to the Father. So there we have that Son of Man. It is it is that idea of service and humility and identifying with humankind. Now to those that more spiritually uh, understood things and had done some study of the scriptures, when Jesus called himself the Son of Man, they would have recognized the implications. They would have seen that this was a quiet nod uh, to the interpretation of the Messiah. Had Jesus gone around excuse me, <laughs> gone around claiming himself as the Messiah, uh, alone, nothing more, he may have been crucified at a much earlier time. He would have incited the disciples uh, to, to push for his death and to bring that part of his ministry to a close earlier than was God's plan. So claiming himself as the Son of Man gave him the best platform to connect with people in all walks of life and not to uh, rush the crucifixion, as it were. By claiming himself as the Son of Man, it had just enough mystery, and you can imagine Jesus doing this, just enough mystery to get people to ask, to seek, and to knock. And these were the words of Jesus, right? Remember when he famously said, keep on asking and you will find, receiving what you ask for, Keep on seeking and you will get it. Keep on knocking and the door will be opened to you. So just a little extra teaching there uh, regarding that title. So verse 31 again, Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders and the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed. But three days later, he would rise from the dead. Now, I'll stop here. This, again, was necessary in his role as Messiah and as prophet because he accomplished every prophecy that occurred in the Old Testament when he was here on earth. So the necessary work of the Messiah, as it was predicted in the Isaiah passages, was that he must die, and after he dies, he must rise again from the dead for our salvation. Verse 32, as he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Well, I want to again just stop us here. This was an unbelievable shock to anyone expecting or hoping that Jesus was the national and political Messiah. And we know among his disciples, 
Jesus had one, Simon the Zealot, and others that would have seen this um, strongly from the point of view of a national and political Messiah. Now there's something else going on here too. We can infer that if Peter was bold enough to rebuke Jesus, he was confident that God had told him what was right and that the idea that he was able to proclaim Jesus as Messiah was given to him by God and that he was right in reprimanding Jesus. But that was wrong. Where it all broke down was that Peter was far too confident in his ability to hear God and somewhat dismissive of how easy it is for him, for us, to hear Satan or to be influenced by Satan. Well, there's several things going on that is interesting to note here before we jump back to the scripture. Think for a moment with me. What kind of relationship did Peter have with Jesus? What freedom did Peter have to rebuke or reprimand Jesus? He had just declared him to be the Messiah, right? Uh, and he was comfortable confronting and correcting Jesus. Next, what kind of love did Jesus have for Peter that he does not just simply strike Peter down for his disapproving words? I mean, this is the God of creation, all powerful. He could have responded any way. But what does he do? What kind of understanding does Jesus have of Peter? Well, he knows his frailties. He knows our frailties. He has concern for Peter's lack of understanding. This was the relationship that Peter and Jesus had. Rather amazing. Um, so then we see in uh, verse 33, Jesus turns around and looks at his disciples and then reprimands Peter by saying, get away from me, Satan. I have to just pause and let that kind of hang in the air. Get away from me, Satan, Jesus says. And then he goes on to say, You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. So here's Peter doing the right thing, saying the right thing in one way, you are the Messiah, but then the wrong thing by reprimanding Jesus. And what does Jesus do? Jesus sets the record straight, and he doesn't mince words, and he says something that I've always thought and felt was had to be so crushing. Get away from me, Satan. These are such strong words. Jesus, however, will not be diverted from his God-ordained purpose. He won't let humans put him in a place of honor or glory that is premature, that is before his resurrection. He will not allow the subversion of God's plan uh, for political or religious power, which is what Satan pushes him to do. This is an illustration, a warning to the disciples and to all, that it is easier than we realize to be influenced and used by Satan. So Jesus exposed how Peter came into this satanic way of thinking. Peter didn't make a deliberate choice to reject God and embrace Satan. He simply let his mind settle on the things of men instead of the things of God. Peter, like others, may have thought the Messiah was a king of David's line, but more often he was thought of as a great superhuman figure crashing into history to remake the world and in the end to vindicate God's people. The Messiah will be the most destructive conqueror in history, smashing his enemies into utter extinction. This is what the theologian Barclay described it as. And so uh, we read again, you are seeing th Peter, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Now in this discussion, we talked a lot about the, another title. There was Son of Man and that, then Messiah. And let me take just a few minutes to talk about the meaning of the word Messiah. Messiah comes from the Hebrew language and means anointed one or chosen one. And the Greek, Greek equivalent is the word Christos, or in English, Christ. The name Jesus Christ is the same as Jesus the Messiah. And in biblical times, anointing someone with oil was a sign that God was consecrating or 
or setting apart that person for a particular role. Thus, an anointed one was summoned with a special God-ordained purpose. So we know in this particular case, Jesus was the true Messiah. He came God-ordained with a special purpose. Now the Old Testament in Isaiah, chapter 42 and chapter 61, predicted a coming deliverer chosen by God to redeem Israel. There's that special purpose, the anointing. And this deliverer, the Jews called Messiah. And Jesus was the Messiah, took that title on, referred to and let others refer to him as the Messiah, just as Peter correctly identified him. And you have to stop and think for a minute in that whole exchange that Peter must have had some understanding from God of who Jesus was as the Messiah. Jesus of Nazareth was and is the prophesied Messiah. We read that in Luke chapters 4 and chapters 21. We read it in, in John 4. And throughout the New Testament, we see the proof that Jesus was the chosen one. And we see this in the miracles that he does. And it says uh, that he is the chosen one when it says this, these miracles are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That came from John 20. We also hear testimonies that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's in Matthew 16. And the ultimate evidence that Jesus is indeed the promised Messiah, the anointed one, is, of course, in his resurrection from the dead. And we read all about that in Acts 10 that as eyewitnesses testified to his resurrection and they testified to the fact that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of both the living and the dead. So Jesus fulfills as Messiah the, pro the role of prophet, the role of priest, the royal uh, um, title of king. And this is further evidence of his being the Messiah. And just quickly, let me just expand on that. He is a prophet because he embodied and preached the Word of God, just like John the Baptist and others. And we read that in John and Luke. He was a priest because his death atones for our sins and reconciles us to the Father. And we read that in Hebrews. And he is a king because after his resurrection, God gave all authority to him. And we read that in John and the book of Ephesians and in Revelation. So Messiah was truly who Jesus was, and Peter was totally correct in, in giving that title to Jesus, correctly identifying him as such. So then we get back into the, the scripture here at verse 35, where Jesus says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul. Is anything worth more than your soul? This is uh, probably one of the better known statements of Jesus and it's used in many contexts. But what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Jesus is talking about denial, denying self. Denying self is not the same as self-denial. We practice self-denial when, for a good purpose, we occasionally give up things or activities. But we deny self when we surrender ourselves totally and completely to Christ and are determined to obey His will. That's what theologian Wearsby says. Further, denying self means to live as an other-centered person. Jesus was the only person to do this perfectly but we are to follow in his steps. We are tr to try with his power to be an other sinner's person. This is following Jesus at its simplest. He carried a cross and he walked down death row, so must those of us who follow him. We have to take up our cross and follow him down that path. Everybody knew what Jesus meant when he said this. Everyone knew that the cross was an unrelenting instrument of death. The cross had no other purpose. The cross wasn't about religious ceremonies. It wasn't about traditions and spiritual feelings. The cross was a way to execute people. So Jesus is very clear about his death, and he's very clear about our death. 
Our death is death to our own spiritual, or, excuse me, our own sinful desires. It is death to the things of this world. It is our dying to these things and living to Christ. Jesus himself, if you remember, had the opportunity to gain the whole world by worshiping Satan, but instead he found life and victory in obedience. So, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Satan had power over the world. God had given him that. And he offered that same power to Jesus, offered him the world. But Jesus would have lost his own soul and did not. Instead, he was obedient to God and had victory. One other thing that I think is interesting that theologian Clark says, and I included it in your notes here, if Jesus, had, if Jesus Christ had come into the world as a mighty, opulent man of great power, glow, clothed with early earthly glories and honors, he would have had a multitude of partisans, but most of them would have been hypocrites. Well, why do I introduce this next verse with that? Well, verse 37. If anyone, uh, excuse me, if anything is worth more than your, is anything worth more than your soul? That, that ties to, and what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Then Jesus immediately in verse 38 goes, If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in the glory of his Father with holy angels. So there's that, that idea that, we want and we expect Christ to be, you know, this incredibly great person. And uh, if we f truly don't understand and follow him and are ashamed because he is so humble, uh, we truly are hypocrites. So Jesus went on to say, I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not die before they see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. Well, we will see in chapter 9, uh, next week, uh, in chapter 9 of Mark, that Peter, James, and John are present at the transfiguration and the unveiling of the glory that Jesus uh, has at the transfiguration. And this corresponds to the assurance by Jesus when he told the disciples that some will see the kingdom of God arrive in great power. So we'll stop there for today and look as we close at two things to consider. One, Jesus asks the disciples two questions. Who do people say I am and who do you say I am? So the question for you and for me, how would we answer these two questions today? So during this week, take some time, some quiet time, and ask yourself those questions. Who do people say I am and who do you say I am? How would you answer those questions from Jesus? And then number two, as you're, maybe it's a different way of answering this question, but something to ponder and to think on. Who is Jesus for the masses today? Who is Jesus for your family, for your friends and neighbors? Who is Jesus for you? So ponder this. Give this some thought. Let it germinate. Think on it. And, as, and then, as you answer for yourself these questions, ask one more compound question of yourself. What do I learn about myself as I answer these questions? And how will knowing the answer direct my life? Amen. Well, you have our pandemic prayer list, and I again, as I have each week, encourage you to pray over some of these on a daily basis. But let me just close us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, take the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts and minds, and use them with your word and with this scripture to grow us and to perfect us until that day when we see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen.